All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. All right. Okay, welcome to the, we're going to start right now. Uh, let me just make sure I have everything set. Everything's looking good. All right. Welcome again to this Invasive Crayfish Collaborative webinar, the fourth of our webinar series. Um, happy Friday. The best way, in my opinion, to celebrate a Friday is to talk about invasive crayfish, crayfish research. So thank you all for joining. Um, my name is Natalia Shkaruk. I'm with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, and I'm the main facilitator of the Invasive Crayfish Collaborative. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the ICC, uh, it's basically a program that brings together a variety of experts and stakeholders to address the threat of invasive crayfish in the Great Lakes. And what we do is we create monthly newsletters highlighting research, uh, recent crayfish literature and news. We host webinars like this one about new crayfish research and programs. Um, we work and collaborate with other organizations and we also help just promote responsible crayfish practices. Um, so before we begin, I just wanted to share uh, a few links that you can follow if you're interested in learning more about the ICC. Um, so you can check out our main website, invasivecrayfish.org, which acts as a one-stop shop for invasive crayfish information. And it's always being updated with more, uh, with new crayfish information. And if you're interested in joining the ICC membership, you can follow the uh, join link um, to find our subscription form and you'll subscribe to our monthly newsletters and you'll receive notifications about our upcoming webinars, meetings, and other ICC related events. Um, and if you're also interested in registering for future webinars or viewing past recorded webinars, uh, you can follow these last two links here with events and webinar ar archives. Uh, and then finally, uh, you can email me at schlotelgetillinois.edu um, if you have any questions or comments. And then I believe that we are going to be adding these links to the chat so that you could easily access them yourselves. Um, so one of the goals of the ICC is to make new information regarding invasive crayfish more accessible, which in turn will make people more informed, enabling them to make better decisions about invasive crayfish management. So in today's webinar, uh, we have Katie Eaton from Auburn University, who is going to be discussing her ongoing work on a novel genetic technique to sex reverse male crayfish, which are also called neo-female crayfish, um, and, and use this as a species-specific control method to reduce invasive crayfish populations. And for those who don't know Katie, she's a fourth-year PhD student in biological sciences at Auburn University, um, her dissertation research focuses on understanding the effects of climate change on the pinfish, which is a highly abundant coastal fish found throughout the Gulf of Mexico and the, West, and the Western Atlantic Ocean. She aims to understand the potential for adaptation or acclimation to warming oceans in the species through examinations of their physiology and genomics. However, she is also interested in invasive species management and is working with Dr. Jim Steckel and collaborators to develop plans to produce and implement a novel genetic technique to sex reverse crayfish. And then prior to her graduate studies, she received a bachelor's degree in biological sciences from the University at Buffalo, where she conducted genetic research on Great Lakes Cisco's. Thank you so much, Katie, for being here. We're all very, very excited. Um, so to everyone joining us today, we encourage you to type in any questions that you may have in the Q&A box or in the chat at any point during the, uh, during the presentation. And then afterwards, we'll go through all of them, um, or as many as we can. Uh, and then also, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and it'll eventually be posted on the ICC website with captions. Um, all right. Uh, so with that, Katie, you can go ahead and share your screen. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction, Natalia. And thank you for thank you all for having me here. Um, <laughs> OK, can everybody see that OK? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so as Natalia said, um, I am Katie Eaton. I am a fourth year PhD student here at Auburn University. Um, and I'm excited to uh, share some of the work that I've been doing with Dr. Jim Stuckel, as well as a larger group of um, collaborators from USGS and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Um, and like Natalia said, uh, the webinar today is going to focus on developing genetic tools to manipulate the sex of invasive crayfish with the hope of using these manipulations as another tool for suppressing invasive crayfish populations. Um, 
So before we dive right in, um, here's just a brief outline of what I'm going to cover today. Um, I'll give a quick overview of some of the negative impacts of invasive crayfish in the U.S. and worldwide, um, which will probably not be news to anyone here, but a good thing to quickly go over. Um, I'll also describe the study species that our group is focusing on, uh, Procambrus clarki, the red swamp crayfish. Um, then we'll take a little detour and talk about just the basics of sex determination in crayfish and other crustaceans. Um, then we'll develop or we'll talk about how we can develop genetic methods to sex reverse a crayfish. And finally, how we can use this tool um, to help control invasive populations. Um, and like Natalia said, if you have questions at any point, you can just put them in the chat. Um, I'll happily answer them after uh, we are done. Great. Um, but so to dive right in um, and to really describe the study species that we're working with, our effects are focused on the red swamp crayfish Procambrus clarki. The species is native to the southeastern US. Um, this kind of tan polygon in this map here shows their native range. Um, but invasive populations have really been rapidly established outside of their native range. So each of the little like orange diamonds on this map represents a non-native occurrence of a red swamp crayfish. So outside of their normal range. Um, these invasive populations are established by the accidental release of individuals from aquaculture or from the aquarium trade. Um, and they can readily establish because this species is really tolerant of a wide array of environmental conditions, um, which makes them pretty strong invaders. Um, and the impacts of these invasive populations on native ecosystems can be really detrimental. Um, so here in the US, introduced populations of red swamp crayfish um, can outcompete native crayfish, um, potentially driving uh, local populations of native crayfish to be extirpated. Um, and as burrowers and really intense um, foragers, they can also change their the newly invaded ecosystem in a variety of ways. Um, because of their burrowing activity, they can change um, the water quality and the turbidity. Um, <clears throat> and like I mentioned, they're pretty intense herbivores, so they can change the abundance of um, native macrophytes. Um, <clears throat> they can also be responsible for disease introduction. Um, they carry diseases that are, um, not found in Europe. So if there, there have been several documented cases of, um, red swamp crayfish being introduced into Europe and then just spreading disease to native populations. Um, so as you can see, um, these invasive populations can really cause, um, some major changes. There are a number of control measures that are currently um, in place that are aimed at managing these invasive crayfish though. Um, these include chemical pesticides um, such as pyrethrin, uh, behavioral manipulations using carbon dioxide, um, sealing up their burrows. Um, as you can see this kind of burrow here, you can seal those up with um, clay burrow blockers um, and just kind of basically trap them in there. Um, and you can also just do kind of traditional baited trapping and removal, um, all of which are control measures aimed at diminishing the size of these invasive populations. Um, <clears throat> but as you all probably know and realize, um, no single control measure is going to be 100% effective. Uh, the aim with all of these control measures is um, to overall reduce the population size of these invasive crayfish, but um, each one by itself is not gonna be able to fully eliminate an invasive population. Um, so our goal here is not to develop like a silver bullet that will magically remove all invasive crayfish. Um, rather, we're just hoping to just develop more tools that we can add to our toolbox, our arsenal, um, that we can use to fight against these invasive populations. Um, and ultimately, it's really desirable to um, develop a control measure that is species specific and has limited effects to non-target organisms. Um, so all of the control measures that I mentioned up here um, can influence other organisms, um, pesticides, 
carbon dioxide trapping um, and burrow blockers all have potentially off target effects. Um, but genetic manipulations present a really interesting, um, potentially species specific control measure um, that we could use. So switching gears um, a little bit here, before I talk about um, the nitty gritty of how we can genetically manipulate a crayfish um, to control an invasive population, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the basics of sex determination in crustacean. So that's how do crayfish develop either as males or as females. By genetically manipulating um, this sex determination system in crayfish, we might be able to add another tool to our toolkit of invasive population control, but I wanna just go over the basics of sex determination first. So we should all be at least somewhat familiar with um, the way that humans um, undergo sex determination. We have chromosomal sex determination. Um, it's basically a fancy way of saying whether you're male or female results from your genetic makeup um, or the chromosomes that you have. So female humans have two of the same sex chromosome. They are XX, um, so they just have two X chromosomes whereas human males are XY. They have one copy of an X chromosome and one copy of a Y chromosome. Um, when these humans make gametes, the female is only able to produce eggs that have this X chromosome, so she's only capable of passing on an X chromosome. Males are capable of passing on either an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. Crustaceans, such as... Um, crayfish, shrimp, and prawns um, also have chromosomal sex determination, but interestingly, it's kind of the opposite way of um, human chromosomal sex determination. In this case, female crayfish are heterogametic, meaning they have um, two different sex chromosomes, so similar to the male in humans. So these female crayfish have one Z chromosome and one W chromosome, <clears throat> and male crayfish are homogametic, so analogous to the female human. They have two copies of the same sex chromosome. They are ZZ. Um, and if we just kind of follow this down to the gametes that they can produce, females have the option of either passing on a Z chromosome or a W chromosome to their offspring, whereas males can only pass on these Z chromosomes. So let's zoom in on this process a little bit further um, and really understand how does a male crayfish develop? Um, so as I said on the last slide, it's the chromosomal makeup of the, or of the organism that really determines their sex. Um, so if we look at this male sexual development process in crayfish, um, you start off with a male that has two chromos two, oh, two Z chromosomes. Um, so during early development, newly hatched juveniles that are ZZ, so genetic males, um, undergo the formation of an androgenic gland. Um, <clears throat> this happens prior to sexual differentiation. So prior to any sort of development of male characteristics, um, they develop this androgenic gland, um, which is just a small endocrine gland. It's located at the base of the fifth pair of walking legs. Um, and this endocrine gland is basically like the master gland for male development. Um, specifically, once this androgenic gland is fully developed, it releases a hormone known as insulin-like androgenic gland hormone, which is kind of a mouthful. Um, so I might also refer to it as just IAG. Um, and this hormone is responsible for basically masculinizing the crayfish. Um, so the development of all these male characters. <clears throat> um, and so the androgenic gland and the subsequent release of androgenic gland hormone are really crucial um, steps in the process of making a male crayfish. <laughs> Zooming in on the androgenic gland a little bit more, um, as I said, this is a small endocrine gland. It's only found in male crustaceans. 
it's interior to the organism. It's um, attached to the posterior vas deferens um, at the base of the fifth pair of walking legs. You cannot see it on this picture. It is very small, um, but I've pointed an arrow to its approximate location here. Um, it is internal to the organism as well as very small, um, but that's generally where it's about. Um, and as I said, it releases IAG, insulin-like androgenic gland hormone, which is responsible for masculinization and sexual maturation. So <clears throat> this is a pretty interesting process, right? Um, you start off with an undifferentiated male and the process of male differentiation hinges on this one gland producing this one hormone. There are other factors at play as well, but these are the two major things. So what happens when you break this process? Um, <clears throat> there's been there's actually been a large amount of research done on this. Um, and there are kind of two points at which you can intervene here. You can intervene at the time of androgenic gland formation, and you can intervene at the time of androgenic gland hormone release. So in the first case, um, there have been a variety of studies that have examined what happens when you prevent androgenic gland development by ablating or removing that androgenic gland. This is a process known as an androctomy, which I'll talk more about later. Um, but essentially you can take a genetically male crayfish, very small little hatchling, remove the fifth pair of walking legs and any attached tissue. So the vas deferens, the um, androgenic gland, and you result in this genetically male individual that has two, uh, two Z chromosomes, but it has no androgenic gland. And because this and androgenic gland is not present, it can't synthesize this IAG hormone and in the absence of that hormonal cue, um, this genetic male will actually develop as a functional female, which is also known as a neo-female. Um, and this is really cool because it's like you end up with a completely genetically male organism that is able to, it looks like a female, it behaves like a female, and it can reproduce like a female. Consequently, um, if we think about intervening at another time point, it results in almost exactly the same thing. Um, in this scenario, rather than removing or ablating the androgenic gland here, you allow the androgenic gland to form as normal, but then you target this hormone that's released by the androgenic gland, our um, IAG hormone. So you inactivate um, this hormone, <clears throat> and it results in the same phenotype of this neo-female. Um, you've got a genetic male, it has an androgenic gland, but the androgenic gland is not working. It's not um, <clears throat> expressing the hormone that it needs, and hence this organism isn't getting the signal to develop as a male. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Okay, so this is cool, right? You can create you can sex reverse a crayfish. That's interesting. What is their utility? Um, so these neo-females, these sex reversed males, um, as, I made, I, as I mentioned on the previous slide, um, can be mated with normal males um, because they behave exactly like normal females and they reproduce exactly like normal females. Um, and so, if we follow this out, um, you have a ZZ female or neo-female. You cross that individual with a ZZ typical male. This neo-female is capable of producing eggs, but her eggs only have this Z chromosome. She's not capable of passing on a W chromosome to her offspring because she doesn't have one. Um, this results in gametes that all have a Z chromosome. Um, and so you end up with 100% um, ZZ male offspring. And this works really well because producing a neo-female is a one-time intervention. Um, so as I mentioned in the previous few slides, 
It's either a quick intervention to remove the androgenic gland, not changing anything of the organism's genetic makeup, or it's a quick intervention to prevent hormone expression. Again, not changing anything in the organism's genetic makeup. So all of these males um, are phenotypically normal. They function as normal males. Um, and yeah. <clears throat> and so this is a pretty powerful tool because you can introduce these ZZ neo-females into invasive populations to ultimately skew the sex ratio towards maleness over time. Um, and this can help limit the reproductive output of invasive populations without freeing up resources. Um, so specifically, many of the management tools that are currently in place um, result in temporary population depression. So whether that's through um, baited trapping and removal or uh, pesticide application, you have some sort of um, temporary population decline, which can free up resources for survivors to rebound and um, take over again, basically. And so if we add neo-females into this sort of framework, um, <clears throat> we can skew the sex ratio over time and sort of prevent that rebound from happening. Because if you have a mostly male population, you target it with pesticides, the few survivors that remain are gonna be mostly male, limiting the reproductive output, um, even if resources are abundant. All right, so let's get into um, some of the commonly used methods of sex reversal. I gave you kind of a preview of this, at least from a theoretical standpoint um, in the previous section, but now I'm gonna describe um, some more empirical examples of how this has been done before and how we plan to do it um, in our approach using the red swamp crayfish. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the sort of first um, intervention, the first potential way that you could generate a neo-female involves the removal of the androgenic gland um, <clears throat> Um, and so this uses a microsurgical approach, um, and it hinges on the removal of the androgenic gland um, during early development. Um, so you have to take a very small hatchling individual um, and subject it to an androctomy. Um, as I said previously, it's you take the base or you take the base of the fifth pair of walking legs, you completely remove them and any attached tissue hopefully removing the androgenic gland. This has been done successfully in several crustacean species, including Macrobrachium rosenbergi, probably the one that's been the most well-studied. Um, and here I've just got a little picture of a um, successfully sex-reversed neo-female um, Macrobrachium rosenbergi carrying fertilized eggs here. Um, <clears throat> So this is a pretty cool approach, um, but it's very technically difficult, very time and labor intensive and relatively low yield. Um, this could be due to the invasivity of the surgery. Um, often um, researchers have had relatively high mortality rates of um, androctomized prawns just because of the like, it's pretty invasive surgery. <laughs> Um, and even like the most prominent sort of well, um, well-established lab that does this all the time has, has success rates and yields around 10%, um, just because of the technical difficulty of this approach. So obviously there's a little bit of a desire to develop, um, <clears throat> a more effective approach And so that leads us into um, genetic manipulation. So there's really been a push to develop um, genetic tools and, interv and interventions to generate neo-female crayfish. Um, and this is kind of an intervention at, more at like the secondary stage. So once the androgenic gland is formed, how can we intervene and prevent it from producing this androgenic gland hormone? Um, the most well-studied 
approach for um, this involves the use of RNA interference technology. Um, so in a typical organism, as I've kind of illustrated here on the bottom of this slide, um, this or organisms contain DNA in the nucleus of their cells, which contains all of the genetic information necessary to produce proteins, such as IAG hormone. Um, the process by which this occurs uses RNA, which is a single-stranded molecule. Um, it's similar to DNA, but not quite the same. Um, and it's a temporary messenger. So just super basically, DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into a protein product of interest. Um, most genetic manipulations, such as those that generate GMOs, target the DNA sequence. Um, so you may have heard of things like CRISPR and gene editing. These are all interventions at the level of the DNA sequence. So you're changing this template in the organism's DNA. And as a result, you're permanent, permanently manipulating the genetic makeup of that organi organism. In the case of RNA interference, um, this is different, different from tech. Oh my gosh. RNA interference is different from traditional genetic manipulations. So instead of targeting this DNA template sequence, instead it targets the RNA, so this temporary messenger molecule, and prevents it from being translated into a protein, pro protein product. Because we're targeting this step of the process, there's no permanent genetic manipulation. Instead, there's just a brief and time-limited prevention of a particular RNA being trans translated into a particular protein. <laughs> so we've got no changes happening to the DNA template, which means we're not actually genetically modifying the organism. We're just briefly interfering in this um, translation process. Um, so this is particularly advantageous because concerns about genetically modified organisms are not relevant here. We, we're not actually permanently changing the genetic makeup of these organisms. To zoom in on RNA interference a little bit more, um, and just to give a very quick overview of how this process works, um, I'll describe this here. So RNA interference depends on the presence of double-stranded RNA in a cell. Most messenger RNA molecules, um, like this little diagram I showed here, um, are single-stranded. So they can easily be translated by an organism's ribosomes into a protein product. Double-stranded RNA um, in a cell is relatively uncommon, and its presence activates this uh, molecule here. It's actually a protein complex known as the RNA-induced silencing complex. This is just a bunch of proteins that work together. Um, upon the detection of double-stranded RNA, <clears throat> this um, RNA-induced silencing complex binds to the double-stranded RNA unwinds it, and then searches the cell for complementary messenger RNA. Um, so something such as this. When this RNA-induced silencing complex that's bound to a double-stranded RNA encounters an mRNA that basically matches the sequence of this double-stranded RNA, it's going to bind to and destroy this messenger RNA. So this gives us a really targeted mechanism by which we can prevent the expression of a particular gene. And this is a naturally occurring process. This happens in um, all of our bodies all the time. It's a way to regulate gene expression. So here we're just exploiting a naturally occurring process um, to prevent the expression of a gene of interest. So. Ultimately, kind of our goal here is if we can generate a double-stranded RNA that is um, that encodes the sequence of our gene that we want to silence, in this case, our insulin-like androgenic gland hormone, 
we can introduce this double-stranded RNA into developing crayfish and preferentially silence the expression of that gene, um, ultimately creating neo-female crayfish. Um, and this has been successfully done in other species. Um, other groups have used RNA interference to generate neo-female um, crustaceans, most notably in the prawn macrobrachium rosenbergi. Um, and in fact, a study by um, Leeser et al., uh, um, some researchers from Israel, actually showed that neo-females that were generated using this um, RNAi technology were not significantly different from populations of normal females. So they behaved as normal, they mated and reproduced exactly as normal females with the singular caveat that they produce 100% male offspring. And the success rates of this approach are far higher than um, microsurgical approaches. Um, indeed, this, uh, this study by Ventura et al. had a um, success rate as high as 86%, which is just leaps and bounds above uh, what the microsurgical procedures found. So um, finally, I just want to begin to describe some of the work that our group has been doing to develop a plan for generating and implementing red swamp crayfish as a method of population control. Um, <clears throat> I want to emphasize that this tool should not be used in isolation. Um, it should be coupled with other tools, like I mentioned previously, trapping, um, burrow blockers, etc. Um, and it can really help suppress invasive populations and prevent population rebound after these other um, tools have been used. So, um, we're kind of still in the development phase. We don't, I don't have a lot of interesting results to show you here, um, but right now we're working to develop a plan to produce and implement neo-female red swamp crayfish. And there's kind of a five phase methodology here that we're going for. Um, so step one is we need to synthesize a double-stranded RNA of our red swamp crayfish um, IAG gene. This can be done synthetically. This will be relatively quick and easy, um, <clears throat> I hope. <laughs> and so once we have that in hand, um, we'll then be able to test its effectiveness. And we can do this by injecting adult male red swamp crayfish with this double-stranded RNA to examine changes in the expression level of this gene. And so here I've just got like a... a basic sample plot of what something like this, what some of these results could look like. This is from um, a paper by Savaya et al. Um, they've essentially tested the same protocol on um, red swamp crayfish, and they found that adult males injected with this double-stranded RNA saw a significant decrease in androgenic gland hormone expression. You can see here this um, on this graph, we've got expression of androgenic gland hormone on the y-axis and treatment group on the x-axis. Our control group has relatively high expression. Our group that was treated with the double-stranded IAG hormone RNA has virtually zero expression. And then this other control group that was injected with an exogenous RNA um, has levels similar to the control group. Um, so this is really a really promising finding from um, Savaya et al. And we're hoping that we would see something similar um, in our tests of this in adult males, because um, that would verify that this works. Um, next, we would um, test this on juvenile red swamp crayfish um, by repeatedly injecting them with this double-stranded RNA throughout development. Um, and this would be done probably around twice a week. That's the frequency that most um, other researchers have worked with. Um, but throughout development, until they reach maturity, you inject them with a solution of this double-stranded RNA um, with the aim of silencing the expression of this gene. And um, something that's important to note the reason that we have to inject them continuously throughout development is because this double-stranded RNA is cleared from the organism's body really rapidly 
um, within about three days, um, you can't detect it anymore. Again, highlighting the temporally limited aspect of this approach. So we would repeatedly inject juvenile red swamp crayfish with this throughout development um, and then assess the sex ratio of developing juveniles. Theoretically, if this works, we would end up with 100% females after this injection because we're injecting them, we're turning off androgenic gland hormone, and we are um, hoping to generate neo-females. Then um, we could take these suspected neo-females and mate them with normal males and assess the sex ratio of their progeny to um, really try to understand which individuals are successfully generated neo-females. <clears throat> if a suspected neo-female is mated with a normal male crayfish um, and she produces 100% male offspring, then we know that that is a successfully generated neo-female. Um, and then once we have generated a few neo-females, we'll be able to basically just repeat this process, um, generating uh, large numbers of neo-females um, for management use. And then um, just kind of getting into the next steps, um, as I mentioned earlier, these neo-females can really be used as a targeted strategy to reduce recovery of invasive populations after other control measures. Um, and so I've just got a brief or a, <clears throat> a simplified diagram here of um, showing how these neo-females can really be used. Um, this is simulated data from this Savaya et al. paper. Um, it's very basic, very um, very sort of early stage. Um, that's what I was meaning to say. Um, and so you don't don't pay too too much attention to like the numbers on the axes and the population size. It's really um, sort of just a quick look at the modeling approach here. Um, but oh, oh God, uh oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so in this simulation, um, they simulated a period of unrestricted population growth um, and then um, beginning around year 15 here, they simulated what would happen if you started stocking neo-females and also, oh my god, I cannot stop clicking the wrong thing. <laughs> What would happen if you started stocking neo-females and also removing um, normal females and males from the population? And you can see that the population really starts to decline and the number of females in the population essentially declines to zero um, relatively rapidly. As you can see by about five years after um, initial uh, trapping efforts begin, the number of normal females in the population is declined basically to zero. Um, the sex ratio is really skewed towards um, males in the population. And eventually um, over time, the population crashes. Again, don't pay too much attention to the, the time scale of the x-axis, it's a little bit skewed, but um, I hope what this graph is illustrating is that um, Neo-females are a really useful tool by which we can skew the sex ratio of the, uh, the population and really limit the reproductive output. And when coupled with other measures, this could be used um, as a tool to eradicate invasive populations. All right, now I actually wanna be on this slide. <laughs> um, so just to kind of wrap up and talk about um, what our group has been working towards here, um, I really want to highlight um, that neo-females represent a, um, another useful avenue by which we could um, continue to attack invasive, pop invasive crayfish um, populations. Um, and future work is going to focus on optimizing this technology for the red swamp crayfish, um, as well as um, invasive species that threaten the Great Lakes region. Um, and with that, that is everything that I have for y'all today. Um, 
If you have feedback, thoughts, questions, comments, concerns um, on this presentation, scan the QR code on your screen here um, and you can it'll it's going to take you to a survey where you can fill out um, just like a brief form highlighting what you thought about today. Um, and if you're really interested in this project, we're hiring a postdoc to work on it. Um, if this sounds like something that's up your alley, um, you can check out the job ad here um, also by so by scanning this QR code or you can go to the link. Um, I'll paste this in the chat as well. Um, but if you're interested in joining a cool team of researchers, um, please hit us up, let us know. Um, yeah, and that's all I have. Great, thank you so much, Katie. That was super, super interesting. Um, it's really exciting to hear about all the different possibilities of using species specific control methods. Um, so we actually have a question in the chat. Um, is it possible for silenced hormones to return slash come back? And I think this question was posed when you were talking about the um, the double stranded RNA um, and how it uh, silences the IAG hormone. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and yes, it is possible for these silence hormones to come back and return. Let me just actually, let me scroll back to the slide here. Okay. So um, <clears throat> because this is a time limited intervention and we're injecting them with this double-stranded RNA that's just silencing hormones um, during development, um, they can come back, but kind of the crucial point in this process is the um, early sexual differentiation. So once an organism is like a fully developed male or a fully developed female, um, the expression of this IAG hormone is not going to matter so much, at least as far as what I know. So Yes, once we stop injecting them, they will start expressing this hormone again. But if we've already got a female here, um, once we've gotten her kind of through that critical period of early sexual differentiation, um, the expression of those hormones is not gonna matter as much. Does that answer your question? I believe it does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we will respond if... It yeah. has or hasn't. Uh, they say, okay. thank you. Yes. Um, uh, next question. Um, is there any sense of the number of neo-females that would need to be introduced to a population to achieve declines? That's another great question. Um, so we're still in the really early phases of this project. Um, and so we don't necessarily know how many we would need to introduce. A lot of that depends on population demographics and modeling that has yet to be conducted. Um, so we are looking to eventually hire someone to come on and do some modeling um, for this project. So if that's something you're interested in, reach out to me or Dr. Stuckel or anyone else on this team. Um, Great. Um, could you describe the regulatory pathway to enable management use slash application? I am sorry, but I do not know. <laughs> um, I'm the wrong person to ask about that. Um, but if you submit that question in the survey, which I can go back to that slide, <laughs> somebody else can answer that for you. Um, I am not a like regulatory person, management person. So unfortunately, I don't know. Um, but just to kind of highlight what I said earlier. Um, <clears throat> this is not the same as producing a GMO. Um, it's a time limited intervention. So there's the the typical uh, man um, the typical regulatory pathway that you would need to go through for like making a GMO does not apply here. Jim, were you gonna jump in? Yeah, I'll just jump in real quick because I, I, that is a really good question and just the you know, kind of add, I'm not, we're not entirely sure. Um, Annie can jump in. She's 
has more knowledge of the regulatory processes, but that is part of the the multi-year plan that we have is as as we're developing the technology, you know, we have several stages of, you know, first trying to figure out what the regulatory hurdles would be and then starting to step through those hurdles as as we are just developing the techniques to produce neo females before they would ever be released. So we expect it'll probably take a year or two to figure out what those hurdles are and to actually move through that process. Um, and, and before that would happen, this would all be just lab-based studies at that point. Great, thank yeah. you so much. Um, we have another question in the chat. Um, would there be any concern if neo-females were successfully created um, those females being introduced into its native range or their male offspring possibly creating a native range collapse of the species. I'm thinking if, say, the Clarkii were reintroduced back. If that's a good, yeah, mm -hmm. I I see I see what we're, I see what we're getting at. Um, that's another really good question. Um, so. I think there would definitely need to be some consideration of this and of where we're using these neo females. Um, I I don't I don't think that would be a huge issue because um, these neo females are like a, a one generation thing, so it's not like they're reproducing and producing more neo females and just completely leading to, sorry, let me go back here. Um, <clears throat> it's not like these neo-females are completely um, leading to the eradication of all these females. Um, what's, what's more happening here is yes, they are skewing the sex ratio, but um, this sort of coupled with trapping is what's really driving this decline in native females. Um, so yeah, I think that's definitely something to be concerned about. Um, but I think the, the likelihood of a large enough number of neo-females getting back into the native range, particularly if we're using them far away, like if we're using them in Illinois, um, or somewhere in the Great Lakes. <laughs> um, I think the likelihood of them coming back, mating with enough males to really skew the population um, in like a meaningful ma way towards maleness, um, I, I don't think that would be a huge issue. I'm sorry, that was a really long answer, <laughs> but- uh, Katie, can I jump in here too? I mean, I think you answered that <laughs> correctly, but I, I think the- the concern is fairly low because like you said, this is not something that's passed on from generation to generation. And the only way that this works for control is with continual introduction of neo females. So you have to do it. It's not just a one-time introduction. It has to be done over and over and over again um, because that if you get a few neo females into a population, yeah, they may temporarily skew the population towards males, but as soon as they die, that that small number dies, then that that population would would go back to the normal um, sex ratios, and so their offspring are not going to further skew that population because there's nothing that's inherited that's passed on to subsequent generations. If, if that helps, but but yeah, if you would, I mean, you wouldn't want to necessarily release you know a, thousands of neo females into a small native population. Um, but that I, I think I think it's hard enough to get this to work to to actually reduce a population that I, I think intentionally, and so I think a few escaped new females are unlikely to have a, a huge impact on the native population. But it, it's definitely something we have to take into consideration, and I think the modeling efforts will show that because you know it's just a flip side of the question of how much how many new females would it take to control a population. And if you know that, then you can use that to model 
what would the harm be if you get so many neo females into a native population? No, thank you. That was that was a great answer. Thanks. Um, I had one more other question, but it looks like somebody else has one, so I'll wait. You could go ahead. <laughs> we'll get to oh, to oh. Aaron's question afterwards. Go ahead. Um, so I'm thinking more along the lines of uh, say Rusticus and Propinquus if this was to be expanded to other species. Does the same type of process work with, say, hybridization with like species? Sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah. So would basically would this process still work with, say, species like Rusticus and Propinquus that could hybridize? Would you would the process still continue on with say a native species if this were to be carried out with species that are similar? Or would this be a process that may not when you have that risk, it just may not be used as a mm. control method? That's a good that's another good question. Lots of good questions today. Um sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I would have to think about that one. Um I think, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't I don't know off the top of my head. Um <clears throat> if anyone wants I, to jump in and yeah, if any if anyone yeah, has better please. ideas than me, um anyone from the team. <laughs> but yeah, I I'm not really sure. I'll think yeah, about that one. Yeah, Jim, what do you think? I think that's a good point and is you know, something to consider, especially with this, you know, again with the, the modeling would probably help us get at that question. I I think, you know, anytime you're releasing something that's modified into the environment, you have to think of a lot of unexpected things that could happen that we wouldn't necessarily think about. And I think that's one of the purpose of this seminar today is to get ideas like, Dusty, that's a great point. And that, you know, think about things that we might not be thinking of, but that we can we can start putting into the models and make sure that we, we take into consideration. I don't know, totally. And I, like I said, I think the work you guys are doing is absolutely great. So keep it up. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Thanks. I didn't have a better answer for you. <laughs> um, we have a, looks like more of like a, a comment saying that the possible effects on native ranges um, is more a concern of other genetic techniques, an example CRISPR. Seems like a benefit of neo-females is that the risk to native ranges is very low and would not persist if they were accidentally released. So. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I concur with Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> Great. This is uh, making me wonder if there is another useful tool that neo-females can, um, can play in this other than just stalking a, a water body. I'm wondering if you had any ideas of how neo-females can be maybe used in aquaculture or other pathways where invasive species are, are introduced. Um, so actually the, so this, this group, this, these folks, Savaya et al. and, um, her, their working group, um, they're based in Israel and they have done a ton of research into this, um, for basically aquaculture reasons. Um, so they work on Macrobrachium rosenbergi, um, which is a prawn, um, and they have, really been interested in developing this technique in order to produce all male populations because um, males are just so much like they're bigger, they give higher yields overall. Um, and also it's really advantageous, like from an aquaculture perspective to produce all males um, so that any escaped individuals like will essentially die off um, after one generation and hopefully not have a huge impact on um, ecosystem. So if you're thinking of culturing something um, outside of its native range, this could be really um, useful in that context as well. Yeah, yeah, that'd be really great. Um, it looks like we don't have any more questions in the chat or in the uh, in the Q&A box. Mm -hmm. um, but if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to either email me and I can send uh, Katie, the questions and connect you two mm -hmm. together. 
um, or directly to Katie and submit your feedback with the QR codes. It's really, really cool. Thanks yes. for, for organizing that. Um, yeah. um, I'll but, just put my email in the chat if anyone wants to email me. Um, if you want to talk about the postdoc, if you want to submit any feedback, feel free to email me um, and Natalia as well. Um, but yeah. Great. Thank you. Answer your questions. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so I guess we can um, end it early and uh, let you all enjoy your Fridays. <laughs> so thank you again. <laughs> Katie, for giving us your time and presenting the very important work that you um, and your collaborators are, are doing to control the spread. Um, and thank you again to our attendees for joining us today. Um, I hope you guys all have a great Friday and a great weekend. Thank you.